Today, we're going to be talking about a virus that infects virtually every child in North America before their second birthday. And the most common disease that this virus causes in little people is a condition called RSV bronchiolitis. RSV, or respiratory syncytial virus, can cause a minor cold in an adult, but physicians usually see this infection when it's causing an infection of the small airways, bronchiolitis, in a child under the age of two. So let's use our framework to help us understand what's going on with this little guy, an eight-month-old boy who's been brought into the hospital ER on a snowy December night. His mother is scared because he has a high fever and seems to be struggling to breathe. Because of this, he hasn't been able to sleep or feed well for the past 24 hours. You can see right away when you first meet this child that he's irritable, breathing faster than normal, and it looks like he's working pretty hard to breathe. The muscles of his neck and abdomen are clearly trying to help out. Even his nostrils are flaring, and there's clear rhinorrhea or fluid running out of his nose. The nurse in the ER has taped a monitor to his big toe to detect the amount of oxygen in his blood, and she tells you this baby's oxygen saturation is slightly below normal. When you examine him, you also hear a wheezy sound as he breathes, and you've noticed that he seems to be grunting a little bit when he breathes as well. Your preceptor tells you that given the time of year and the baby's symptoms, it's highly likely this little guy has an RSV infection. RSV is an enveloped RNA virus with two large glycoproteins, F and G, that are important for immunity and pathogenesis. The F protein is involved in fusion of the virus and host cell plasma membranes, forming the syncytia that can be seen in vitro with specific cell cultures. This explains where RSV got its name. To definitively diagnose RSV, you could ask the virology lab at the hospital to test for RSV in a swab or aspirate from the nasopharyngeal space. Because RSV doesn't usually live in or colonize healthy people, finding it in any of the respiratory secretions means the patient has the infection. From late October to early March, lots of babies are brought to the ER with these symptoms. Some of them will even die from this disease. This child's dad has also been sick, but only with a minor cold. He may have sneezed nearby and our patient breathed in the virus. This is one of the reasons we see so many RSV infections during the winter months when people spend more time indoors in close quarters. Once the RSV got inside of our patient, his immune system recognized a viral invasion and deployed some chemical messengers things like cytokines and leukotrienes to try and protect him. And as a result, the upper respiratory tract started secreting mucus to try and stop the virus from moving further down the respiratory tract. The, the blood vessels in this area also became a bit leaky and blood flow to the upper respiratory tract increased as well so that white blood cells and other protective factors could get to the virus in the hopes of stopping it in its tracks. The extra mucus and the vasodilation in the baby's nasal passages caused the congestion and the runny nose that's making him so miserable. And the chemical messengers also caused his temperature set point to rise, giving him a fever. But unfortunately, in this case, the virus kept moving down the respiratory tract, despite the efforts of the respiratory cilia in the airways trying to beat it back upwards. And also despite the increased respiratory secretions and blood flow to that area. Now, these were the immune system's efforts to stop the virus from causing more harm. But all of these changes also contributed to the symptoms that brought this little guy into the hospital. If the virus had been stopped at any of the early stages, in the nasal passages, for example, our baby would have ended up with a milder upper respiratory tract infection, or URTI, a rhinitis, a pharyngitis, or a laryngitis, depending on where the virus had stopped. But because the inoculum, or the amount of virus that our patient first breathed in, was pretty substantial, and because his immune system wasn't strong enough to win this battle in the early stages, 
the virus managed to move deeper into the lower respiratory tract, invading the bronchioles and the alveoli. In the bronchioles, this child's immune system kept on trying to protect him, trying to prevent the virus from going any further. The epithelium of the small airways began to slough off. More mucus was released into the lumen, and the walls of the bronchioles became swollen as blood flow to the area increased. All of these things were immune system attempts mediated by chemical messengers to block the further passage of the virus into the lungs. But they also made it really hard for our little patient to breathe because the diameter of each tube was made so much smaller. The narrowed airways also caused the wheezing sound that you heard when you examined him, and his grunting was actually an effort to create positive pressure to keep those small airways open. Often, this narrowing of the bronchioles can trigger prolonged coughing spells as a child tries to clear some of those secretions from his airways. This bronchiolar hyperreactivity might make you think about asthma, and the two can be very similar in terms of their clinical presentation. In fact, there's an ongoing debate about whether or not RSV bronchiolitis is maybe just the first manifestation of asthma in a child who had an underlying predisposition for the disease, or whether the RSV bronchiolitis caused some kind of damage that predisposes a child to asthma attacks later on. When RSV gets down into the bronchioles and the alveoli, the lungs can't do their job of oxygenating the blood very well because the diffusion interface gets thicker than it should be. And this is because of the increased secretions and the edema at that interface. This means that carbon dioxide and other waste products in the blood can't get out as efficiently, and oxygen in the inhaled air can't diffuse into the blood as quickly as it should. Remember the nurse who told you that this baby's oxygen saturation was slightly low? Well, it's likely that this baby's lungs weren't able to exchange gases as efficiently as they do when he's healthy. The good news is that RSV doesn't change much from year to year. And while we don't yet have an effective vaccine to routinely prevent RSV infection in all children, we do have a way of protecting some high-risk babies from this infection by giving them passive antibody protection from the virus during the winter months. The difference between these two methods of prevention is that the first kind, vaccination, involves triggering the immune system to mount its own long-lasting response by exposing it to an inactivated version of the original pathogen. Passive antibody protection involves giving a child the products of an immune response, the kind of immunoglobulins that are typically made to fight a virus like this, the only downside is that these passive antibodies don't last very long, so they need to be given monthly to high-risk children during the winter months. Babies who are at risk of getting really sick from an RSV infection fall into a few categories. If they were born prematurely, or if they have some degree of chronic lung disease, and that's often a result of the prematurity. If they have a form of congenital heart disease that reduces the oxygen saturation of their blood to start out with, so a further reduction due to an RSV infection would really cause trouble. And then there are children who are born with neuromuscular disorders like cerebral palsy who lack the muscular strength or coordination to cough out the secretions and successfully clear their airways. These are also considered high-risk children. And finally, if a child is immune suppressed for any reason, these are all children who would be good candidates for monthly doses of immunoglobulin. Luckily, even though our patient was suffering from bronchiolitis, he did well on supportive therapy in the hospital. He received supplemental oxygen delivered through a face mask, and he received fluid and some glucose through an intravenous line. So you can see from this baby's ordeal that knowing the characteristics of the microbe RSV, how it enters and exits the host, as well as the fact that the virus has a tendency to colonize, persist, and replicate in the small airways of a young child, this knowledge can inform our prevention efforts and our treatment strategies. Similarly, recognizing that the immune system's early efforts to eliminate the virus can actually cause many of the symptoms of the disease 
This can facilitate the timely diagnosis and treatment of patients like this little boy.